So the responsibility of uh, responsibility of management number one in the financial statements audit or financial audit, one of the responsibility is preparation of the financial statement in accordance with the applicable financial framework. Number two, they have a responsibility to ensure internal controls are working. Uh, that is necessary to enable them to prepare financial statement which are free from material misstatement. Number four, they have the responsibility to provide the auditor with access to all available information that can make the auditor have or come up with a good conclusion. They have that kind of responsibility. They also have the responsibility to detect and prevent fraud. That is also another responsibility that they have. Okay. Any other thing that you feel uh, is a responsibility of the management when it comes to financial statement audit? You are currently the only person in this conference. What are other responsibilities? Can somebody tell me one of the responsibilities or apart from these ones? We know they want to detect and prevent fraud, come up with the applicable financial framework, and that one we had seen. We've seen this one. Financial framework is acceptable. So they had the responsibility to come up with the applicable financial framework. So your role is to check whether they are acceptable. <clears throat> Those are already five points. Those are already five points. Another one is uh, safeguarding of companies' assets. Yes, that is also their responsibility. Nice. Okay. So if these conditions are uh, are not present, they don't understand. Meaning that uh, you've tried to check before starting the work, before you start your audit work. These preconditions do not exist. Meaning that the client doesn't understand their responsibilities. Then you now have to have a meeting with the client. So uh, you need the auditor shall discuss with the management. You have a meeting with the client and explain to them. If they have refused to accept, then the auditor shall not accept the audit engagement. If they don't accept their responsibilities, responsibilities then you have no option but to reject the assignment. So uh, you need to check whether the financial reporting framework that they have used is acceptable, then also check if they have not, they have agreed with the above terms and conditions. So that is basically repetition. Okay, now uh, we are in the last uh, part of the engagement that you need to check. That is a letter of engagement or audit engagement letter. I normally call it LOE, letter of engagement. So what are some of the content of letter of engagement? These ones we discussed in our classes. You need to check that uh, it has the scope and objective of the audit. Come on, audit, you have to tell us it is the audit for which year, financial statement for which year. That is letter of engagement. So advantage of letter of engagement is that uh, it, uh, it helps to avoid misunderstanding regarding the audit. It avoids misunderstanding regarding the audit. That is one thing that you, one reason why we normally have a letter of engagement. Number two, it is a formal way of communicating that the auditor understand they accept the engagement. It also is also a way in which the parties communicate to show that they are both understanding, they both understand the engagement and accept it. Let's look at the content. So the first one, the first content is about the scope and objective of the engagement. The next one is the responsibility of the auditor. We are saying on the letter of engagement, you need to indicate the responsibility of both the auditor and the responsibility of the management. The next one is about identification of the applicable financial framework for the preparation of the financial statement. It is through the letter of engagement where they are supposed to show the applicable financial framework that you are going to use. Then it is also a reference you can also use it uh, for future reference that uh, you are appointed and you guys agree in terms of the terms and conditions. So reference to an expected form and content of any report to be issued by the auditor. So it also shows the kind of report that we need to give, the kind of report that we expected to give by the auditor. Those are some of the responsibilities of letter of engagement. 
Unfortunately, it's the only question that has been brought the same that I now will get. Let's just still continue getting the content. The questions will come. Questions will come. Question. Okay, so let's proceed. So apart from the above, okay, you've given me the year, December 2014. December 2014, question number. Question number four. Question number four. Question number 4B. Yes, I've seen that question. The question says, December 2014, question number 4B. The question says, the auditor may decide not to send a new, a new audit engagement letter, engagement letter, or other written engagement, other written agreement each period. However, there are certain factors that may make it appropriate to revise the terms of the engagement letter to remind the entity of the exiting of the existing terms. With reference to the above statement, elaborate on eight factors that might pursue the auditor to revise the terms of engagement, the terms of the audit engagement. Yeah, it is talking about uh, audit engagement. Twenty twelve of also December. So this one is talking about uh, when do we revise terms and conditions of engagement? We look at that. December twenty twelve. There was a question again about the same. It was asking December twenty twelve. Question four. You can write down. Yeah, we look at that. Thank you very much, Abdallah. Twenty twelve of December. The question was asking. According to uh, ISA twenty ten. That means that agreeing with the terms of audit engagement, ISA 2010, agreeing with the terms of audit engagement, the form and content of the audit engagement. Now, when you sign the engagement letter, that shows that you agreed with the terms of audit engagement. When you just sign these terms and conditions, the LOE, that shows that you've agreed with the terms of audit engagement. Yes, the form and content of the audit engagement letter may vary for each entity. Nonetheless, the standard provide guidance on the matters an audit engagement letter may make a reference to. What audit engagement letter might make reference to? Explain the matters highlighted by ISA 2010 to which an audit engagement letter might make reference to. So later, uh, what does the letter of engagement make reference to? In fact, this one is very direct. That's and you're easy. Hapa tumesema, reference to an expected form and content of any report. Letter of engagement make reference, uh, uh, reference to an expected form and content of report. So it shows you what is the form of report? What is the content of that particular report? That is number one. We are being told that other matters, again, that it can make reference to, additional matters that may be included in engagement letter as a reference, elaboration of the scope. It will show the scope of the engagement. Uh, the next one, the form of any other communication, form of any other communication as a result of the engagement. The form of communication, the nature and content, I mean, the form and content of report, the scope of audit. I hope you are writing those ones. Uh, another thing is that the fact that due to the inherent, due to inherent limitation of an audit scope of internal control, there is an unavoidable, unavoidable risk that uh, sometimes that some material misstatement may not be detected, even though the audit is properly planned and performed according to ISA standard. You can also include that. 
arrangement between arrangements regarding planning and performance. Arrangement regarding planning and performance. What else do you think uh, management letter can refer to? Arrangement regarding the planning and performance. Expectation that management will provide written uh, representation. That is also there. An agreement. An agreement of management to provide draft financial statement and other information in time to allow auditor to complete, complete the audit in accordance with the proposed timetable. Engagement letter can also have that, which is an agreement that the client will be able to draft financial statement and provide information that is required in time. So, so. an agreement of management to inform auditor of facts that may affect the financial statements. An agreement to inform the auditor in terms of the facts of the statement. Yeah, the basis of audit fees, that is also very true. That is also very true. Okay, uh, any other any other contribution? Who wants to suggest anything? We also have the one about uh, restriction. Any restriction of the auditor's liability when such possibility exists. We talked about the terms and conditions where the auditor and the client might agree on auditor's liability. They can also talk about that. Reference to any further agreements both between auditor and the entity, yes. And then any obligation to provide audit working papers to other parties. If the auditor needs to provide working papers to other parties, then they have to also and mention that. So we talk about the basis on which the audit fees are computed. Uh, maybe a request, a request by the auditor to the management to show an acceptance or acknowledgement of the audit engagement. Mm -hmm. Agreement concerning the involvement of auditor, of other auditors and expert to some aspect of the audit, just in case the expert uh, knowledge is required, we can also put that, that we might need an expert as part of the, our audit process. So uh, those are areas that uh, were worthwhile looking into. I hope uh, you've taken note of them. You can take a screenshot, or I hope you've written at least some of them. Recurring audits. Who can tell me what a recurring audit is? Recurring audit, recurring audit. Recurring audit. The current audit is basically a continuous audit. This is the audit that you're doing for the second time, the third time in a continuous basis. Eh? So uh, I hope you're together. A recurring, something that is recurring is repeating. Eh? So you've done the first year, you're going to do the second year and the third year it is recurring. So this is the question that was being asked. Remember the question that we read, it was 2014, question 4B. That was asking, with reference to the above statement, elaborate eight factors that might pursue the auditor to revise the terms of an engagement, meaning that the first terms and of engagement were already agreed on, and you've done some years of audit. Now you are want to revise for another term. When you are now approaching second year, you want to revise the terms of engagement, because it is expected that once you've gotten an audit work, the terms of engagement might, might remain the way it is. So auditing firm for more than one, one financial year. Yes, that is very true. That is nice. So we are saying that uh, once you've been appointed as an auditor, the first year you are expected to do the audit. You've agreed with the terms of engagement that we've seen up there. But then you can also say that uh, 
In the second year, things have changed. So you have to revise those terms of engagement. When you are revising terms of engagement, when you are revising terms of engagement, what are some of the things that you need to consider? You need to consider that, is there any change? The way you agreed on the first time, is there any change? Those things that might change are the ones that can also make you change some terms. So when to revise the terms of engagement on a recurring audit or continuous audit, the following factors may indicate that it will be appropriate to revise the terms of engagement. Uh, just to remind the entity on the existing terms. Number one, these are what they wanted. Any indication that the entity misunderstands the objective and scope. Any indication, once you've seen any indication that the client doesn't understand the objective of the audit, or maybe he doesn't understand the scope of the audit, then in that case, you need to do what? You need to uh, ask the client, revise the terms of engagement. So, so. Number two, a recent change of senior management. If there is a change in senior leadership, you can also, uh, you can also do what? You can also request to change the terms and conditions because probably the CEO, the previous CEO, the previous board do not understand the terms that you agreed upon. So the new one might require change. Additional services. Additional services, for example, now the client is talking about you giving tax services, bookkeeping, consultancy. Those ones can make you uh, change the terms of engagement, additional services. Another one, if there is a significant change in ownership, the owners who are there have actually changed. We have new on new leaders or we completely have a different company. It was initially a single company, they have merged together. That can actually. So this is basically what this question for 2014 was asking you to state and explain. It was asking you with reference to the above statement, elaborate eight factors, elaborate. Now, if you are told to elaborate, it means that you have to explain Kidogo. Don't just post Adapu Explain how they are. And probably they are going to give you eight marks. So if you're told to give eight, state those eight and explain, explain or expound. Another one is about a significant change in the nature of uh, nature or size of the company. Probably last year when you did an audit or some previous years, you did an audit, the company only had one branch. Right now the size has, has expanded, it's now bigger. So, so, and the nature has also expanded. A change in legal requirement, yes, Legal requirement, regulatory and legal requirement might also change. Now you have to do more or even reporting standards now increase. The way you need to report has also changed. That can also cause, uh, that can also cause a change. So, so, okay. Any other thing apart from what we are seeing here, like now the change in financial reporting framework and the change in other reporting requirements, what else do you think can make you request for a change? What else can make you request for a change? I want to see my good student commenting. I might be talking alone. The good thing with this class, we move as we revise past paper questions. So at least uh, we bring the points home. Which one? Just in case you forgot about this one, which, which one else? Maybe you can think about changing technology or complexity of doing business. Changing technology. Can you revise audit fees with client? Yes. Yes, changing audit fees can also cause that. You can revise audit fees. When you are putting audit fees, but that will take a time. Uh, when you are putting for audit fees, you are expected to give a uh, 
a clause that says that uh, you can actually revise it. You can actually revise it because every year things change, even the economy itself changes. So you have to give that option for revising. Uh, look at this. Eh? I want to share with you one here. Uh, I want to share with you an example here. I hope, uh, yes. When you look at this, for example, this was an LOE. So we have here provision for external audit for financial year 2019. Audit fees were 3,000. But then you give some terms and conditions here. Number one, you say that uh, the fees indicated above are exclusive of VAT. So they know it is not part, VAT is not part of it. You also give them instruction concerning the withholding tax. For professional fees, withholding tax are normally 5%. So you say that withholding tax of 5% to be deducted from the fees net of VAT and a withholding tax certificate is issued to us at the time of payment. 50% of audit fees, 50% of audit fees is normally uh, charged or paid before commencement of the audit work. So you agree that, uh, Sisi, Kabla Tuanze Kazi, you'll pay us at least a half of the audit fees. That is a half of this. This makes the client become more committed because at least I easy Kosa to Lipa, how to Kazi. But this one is very important, Klaus. So this is why this LOE, this particular LOE was very important because it has some terms and conditions from your side. Look at this. The fees will be subject to review each year and will vary with a number of factors, including development in business. Then if the can increase, we shall judge you more. Of course, there are a lot of factors like economic factors can also make us judge you. Another thing that you can also mention under terms and conditions when you are putting the audit fee, you can also say that uh, the disbursement related to travel, printing, telephone will apply and will be agreed upon on bill at cost. And bill at cost, the amount shall not exceed 10% of the total audit fees. That is 35,000 disbursement. Sasa, now when you are quoting audit fees in exam, they will, they will always ask you, what are some of the factors that you consider when quoting audit fees? I think we looked at that, right? Can somebody say that we looked at that? Can somebody comment that we looked at that in our last class? Yes, we did, thank you very much. So we don't need to go again on that. Okay, so uh, what else? Uh, Acceptance of change in terms, a change in the terms of audit engagement prior to completion may result from. So this one is different from what we just looked at. Remember, you started an audit work, but now, hapo katikati, you want to change the terms and conditions of engagement. This one is different from a recurring audit. We had a situation where we are looking at a change in terms of the or review of terms and conditions when we are still doing audit for the second year, third year, you know, continuing audit. But the first one, Elisha, Sasa Tunanza, the second one. Kabla Tuanze, we have to agree again. But in this particular one, we are not talking about you, you have agreed the terms and conditions. Umeaza Kazi. Kabla Umalize, you want to change your mind. The same, same report, Ujapeana, but you want to change your mind. So this one is what we are looking at. The same assignment, your assignment number one, Uliko Nafanya for the first year, but Kabulu Malize, you are not changing your mind. What are these? A change, in, a change in the terms of audit engagement prior to completion before Malize, Kazi. And this is something they can bring to you in exam. So you need to be very keen and read within the line. We have a situation where you change. So we were saying, before we end off, we were saying that uh, there are changes that can come when you have started doing your work. But before Malize, you want to change your mind. What can cause that? Number one, 
if you are doing audit, then you realize that uh, there is a change in circumstances affecting the need, of, for, need for the service. How can this happen? That the first one, the need was maybe basically for statutory audit. But now things have changed. This report is going to be used for more than the normal statutory audit. The circumstances under which there was need for audit has changed. The reason for the need for audit has changed. So that one, then it means that you can also change your mind and say, let's review, uh, let's review the terms and conditions. Because now this report it is not just required for the, the same purpose that we agreed, we agreed upon. The next one is misunderstanding as to the nature of the audit or the related service originated originally requested. If we have misunderstanding, there's misunderstanding between me and the client, then obviously we have to agree again. We have to agree again if there is a misunderstanding between me and the client. Restriction on the scope. The end of my answer, Kazi, alapo hapo katikati wa mefunga mkono, unambi wati wezi yenda hapa, wezi angalia hii, and they have given you the work to do. So whether imposed by management or posed by other circumstances, you realize that the scope is now limited, you are restricted, then you can change the nature, the, the, the engagement. In fact, if the scope is limited, you can even tell them that now you want to do a review engagement because you can't perform real audit. Or you can even reject the whole audit process and just stop doing audit. Now, in exam, if they ask you, what are the conditions that can make you review or change the terms and conditions of audit before completing the audit, at least now, to Kopamoja? Though I will share with you these notes. Uh, I don't think there is anything here that is very important now that they can bring in question, maybe about planning, uh, planning of the audit of financial statement, planning of the audit financial statement. So the audit should be planned. The reason why you need to do planning, maybe they can ask you an exam, why do you want to do planning? It saves time, it helps to allocate resources well. Uh, it also makes you understand the nature of the audit. It also reduces the audit risk. Those are reasons for planning. That's maybe basically what the ANCAS can ask you about that. So let's look at this. Importance of planning, audit planning. Those are the areas they can bring in exam. So uh, number one, it, it, is as, it assists in the selection of engagement team members with appropriate level of capabilities. When you plan well, you can be able to select the right people for the right job. That is something that they can bring, importance of planning. Number two, it facilitates the direction and supervision of engagement team and review their work. So when you plan well, then it helps you to be able to supervise properly. You can know the stages where you've reached. Even if you're going to supervise, you know what is expected. So you can know whether the executor, that is the audit auditor or audit senior is behind or is in line. The next one, uh, it assists where applicable to coordinate with the work of an expert. If you plan very well, then you know when you can bring in an expert and when you can actually uh, add some specialized uh, group of people. Maybe you need uh, somebody who is quite experienced, even if it's not an expert. So through planning, you can easily, you can easily uh, coordinate well with other professionals or experts or uh, people who have experience or skill. Planning also helps the auditor develop an appropriate attention to most important areas. Those are the key areas where we have most chances of having risks the key areas of high risk, you can, develop, you can de devote appropriate attention to those areas. Then also, uh, it also helps the auditor to properly organize and manage the audit engagement so that uh, it is performed in an effective and efficient manner. If you don't plan well, you can't perform your work. Any work, not just audit efficiently. Efficiently, you cannot. It also helps the auditor to identify problems earlier and make corrective measures. If you've been in my class, I taught you about uh, reviews. And we say that one of the reviews that we have is called hot review. Now, when you plan very well, you'll be able to do hot review 
and you'll be able to make corrective measures in time. So it will help the auditor identify and resolve potential problems on a timely basis. So, so, so through hot review, you can easily be able to, you can easily be able to identify areas of uh, where the problems are and uh, sort them on time. Those are advantages of planning. I hope you guys have written all of them. Have we? Have we written all these importance of planning? You will add that in terms of maybe the re, uh, reduction of risks, allocation of resources, utangeza easy, supervision itakwara easy. Then also uh, maybe uh, selecting the appropriate team, hot review, peer review, post final review, second partner review. Uh -huh. Those ones we had discussed. Yeah. So let's go to uh, other areas. Internal controls is easy ni meangalia mara mingi, mara mingi, mara mingi. And then materiality concept. I like this, I like this. I think there was a materiality question somewhere. So uh, those internal controls, you know them, the procedures and policies that we normally put in place to ensure that uh, the organization meets their main objective. And of course, the objective is basically to achieve business uh, goals. So the most important about all these policies and procedures that we put in place and implement is to make sure that we operate efficiently and then reduce risk. So these are important for achieving the business objective. Now, the most important, so in exam, they can even bring this. They can tell you that according to ISA 350, internal control systems, give us factors to consider in understanding internal control system. So we will see according to ISA 350, 315, unanza kustuka. No, they are not even important. These ones are not even important. What is important is the question now. Factors, in fact, you can even rub these other ones. Then you just start from reading these factors to consider in understanding internal control system. How do you, what do you need to take into account for you to understand the internal control systems? Yeah. Number one, participation by those who are charged with governance. You need to understand the mood or attitudes of those who are charged with governance. Are they letting the controls working? Do they let the control system to work? or they are doing their own things. No, kuna mali unayazaenda, watu wana wako very, they really restrict, or they don't want to accept that controls have come. Alafu na kwambia, deno umekuja na kierere, sisi tumeka hapa four years, five years, but we've never seen such kind of a thing. It is never working. Where sasa umekuja na kierere? It cannot work here. That one happened, especially when he joins a team as a new team member. Then management philosophy and operation style, how they operate and what they believe in. You see, those values, those are things that again, will help you to understand the controls or the, how it, you know, control system work, internal control systems work. Then next one is about communication and enforcement of integrity and ethical values. How do they communicate? Do we have organizational structure? Organizational structure. How do they communicate and pass information? How do they enforce integrity and values? For example, is there a penalty or something like uh, maybe if you don't ensure integrity, unabile, unazaitua, wabiwe, you are suspended, such things, such things you need to ask yourself. The next one, chart of authority. Of course, this one goes in line with the organizational structure. Who has the powers and how do they respond? Who gives orders? You need to understand those ones. HR policies and practices and procedure manuals. Then commitment to competence. This one is normally one of the values, competency, integrity, those are some of the values. So these are some of the things that you need to consider so that you can understand the internal control system. Is there any question there? Factors to consider so that you can understand the 
the internal control systems in an organization. Is there any question there? So let's look at materiality. That is uh, ISA 320. Uh, I just wanted to mention something about internal control systems. Uh, components of internal control systems, or sometimes they can use the word elements of internal control system. Who can tell me those ones? Components of internal control system use the word crime. Let me just put it here, crime. So we have C there, then we have R, then we have I, uh, I, then we have M, then we have E. So when we start with E, these are components of internal control systems. E is control environment. Now, under control environment, these are where you are going to check these ones. These are the control environment, the attitudes of people who are charged with governance, the philosophy, the communication, the charts. Is it an environment under which control can work? That is control environment. So in exam, they can ask you to give factors to consider in understanding the internal control environment or internal control system, they are these ones. But if they ask you about components of internal control system, are these ones risk assessment risk assessment the next one is about in in information information communication then this one is called monitoring and evaluation monitoring and evaluation. These are components. Then we have existing control activities. Activities, activities. So these are basically the components, not factors to consider. Factors to consider are these ones. Now, under the components, we are talking about the things that make up internal control systems or things that you need to check again to ensure or things that are, as a manager, you need to look into so that you can even understand the strength of internal control system. We are not talking about the environment only. Somebody has given me something. Let me see on the chat. Risk assessment, risk management, monitoring. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Those are very right. Now, these are the ones that we call components of internal control systems or ICS. The first one, you can crime it by using this acronym. Crime. Control environment. You've seen these ones. Then now we talk about risk assessment. Risk assessment we did during lunchtime. We said that you need to check the areas of high risk and how can they expose the client. So for you to understand the client very well, during lunch hour, we say that uh, you perform risk assessment. You need to first identify the risk, then look at how they can occur, then look at the preventive measures that can be put in place. Then when we talk about the uh, information communication, this one we are talking about the way information is being passed. For example, if it is about accounting information, the auditors, the, the, the accounting managers or CEOs, how do they move this information to the cinema's people? The accountant needs to report in the system. They report or give reports to finance manager, which is FM. FM give the same report to the CEO. The CEO give report, relevant report to various uh, committee at the director level. Directors, we have education, we have uh, maybe finance and investment, we have uh, uh, maybe a compliant and then add our supervisory committees. So then we have executive. So the CEO needs to know how we are going to communicate. So communication in terms of how you're going to communicate the information that relates to the operation, that's number one. 
Other information that we also can also consider under this one is the information that relates to training and, and maybe passage of relevant instruction to people. How do you, uh, how do you train management, uh, no, no, sorry, employees? You need to explain to them the changes that have come, the policies that we're talking about here, the rules, communicate to them appropriately. So, so, so that is very important. The next one is about monitoring and evolution. Once you, the environment is well understood, you've done risk assessment, you've come up with the right policies and procedures, you pass such kind of information to the people and even give them channel of reporting so that we reduce informational risk or data risk. Now you try to evaluate, monitor and check if these things are working, check if there is anything that should be added, check if there is any gap. After that, you now, Ask yourself, with the current business that we have, what are some of the policies that we have? What are some of the policies and procedures or operations that we have? How do they affect the risk, the level of risk that uh, we are already exposed to? So that is existing activities, existing control activities. What are the existing ones? Then you can be able to adjust what is in place. Basically, we're not saying that they have to be in this order. This one can even be number one. This is just a way of mastering them, existing control activities, or the nature of our business that we're doing. How do they contribute to the risk that can be uh, controlled? How can they be, uh, how can they affect the internal control systems, the nature of businesses? So, so, so you look at the control activities. For example, if the business that we're doing, we need to have approval processes authorization procedures. The nature of business allows approval. The approval and the control activities. So they work hand in hand. The nature of business might be accepting some kind of controls. So which ones are currently existing? Then from there, we can know how to improve. Let me go to this particular area. So this one is a components of internal control system. I hope you written those ones. You written those ones. Let me just put them down here. components of ICS. Then I can now uh, unbold this, but to bold this one so that it become part of your notes. Then I remove this one from here. Okay, so this one can be numbered. Fine, now it looks nice. Okay, so let's look at materiality, the concept of materiality, the materiality concept. What is materiality? I normally give example in class with a situation where the information that you have can actually make you make an uh, alternative decision or otherwise decision. So we are saying that materiality refers to impact of an omission or misstatement of information. So this is a situation where Either a subtraction of certain information or addition can make you change your mind. Today, for example, if you are supposed to get married and you have a very beautiful girl, she tells you, I only have one baby girl, any name Totowaki. Then after some three years or two years of dating, you realize that this lady has two more children at home with a mother. And these kids are almost 10 years old. You didn't have that information. That is an additional information. So we are saying, if such kind of additional information, you didn't have it, but it has come in. If such kind of additional information can make you change up your mind, then that means that uh, that information is material to you. Some people, it might not be material. So that's why we normally say that materiality is a judgmental concept. That concept is quite uh, judgmental. It depends on somebody. But on the same hand, if that information withdrawn from you and information that when it is withdrawn from you can make you change your mind that is also material for example if today you are supposed to get married to a man this man tells you that you know i work with kenya police i'm the commander manning police station i'm the ocs only to realize that uh, this person is a corporal so is at a lower level than the ocs that kind of information that you have 
has been taken away from you, has been subtracted from you. If that subtraction of information can make you change my, your mind, and now not marrying this guy because you wanted a commander, or CS, you didn't want a corporal, then that information that has been taken away from you, yenye imetolewa, sasa wamebaki bila hiyo information on him. That information, if it can make you change your mind, then that is material. That is material. So it is a concept. Materiality is a concept within auditing and accounting relating to the important or significance of an amount, transactions, or discrepancy. And of course, we are talking about these things. These are information. When you talk about this, these are data. They are information in terms of figures. So the significance or the importance of such kind of information. Is it so important that it can make you change your mind? Yes or no? That depends on the user. Now, for example, uh, if, for example, the information that you're talking about is a financial statement that was misstated, but then you realize that this kind of misstatement, I cannot let it go. I'm not going to invest here because I realize that it has been misstated to this extent. If that kind of misstatement that you've realized can make you change, up, change your mind, then it is material. So let's look at this. The objective of an audit of financial statement is to enable the auditor to express an opinion whether the financial frameworks are prepared in all material respect in conformity with an identified financial framework, a reporting framework. When determining audit materiality, the auditor must consider the following. So when you are trying to look at the materiality in terms of audit, you need to look at the following. Number one, misstatement or omission. Kuna ka information wametoa, wame omit. Either wameweka misstatement or they have omitted such kind of information. So if they are considered to be material, if they individually or aggregate or aggregate in aggregate could reasonably be expected to influence the economic decision of the user. Yani it can make the user change his mind. If such kind of omission or additional information that is not true, you've increased or added, added information that is not true, or you've omitted, and you may kuweka. If that kind of omission or addition can actually influence the economic decision of the user not to invest, he can change his mind, then that is something that is, we can consider as an auditor. Judgments about materiality should be taken in a light, in light of surroundings. Surroundings. We talk about the size, the nature of the misstatement. Then you can make the, the correct judgment. And then materiality is a matter of audit judgment. I explained this earlier. It's about judgment, taking into account auditor perception of financial statement information. And so you'll find that whatever is material for me might be immaterial, meaning that it is not having impact. It does not have impact. So whatever is material to me can be immaterial to others. So, so, so that is why we are saying it is an audit judgment, of course, taking into consideration the perception of the auditor. It's, it depends on how the auditor sees it. So materiality discussed in terms of points. Performance materiality, we can have material terms on the performance. You can say these people have not done well. So lower than materiality for financial statements as a whole. Relative relativity of financial statements, overall materiality level for the financial statements, these are not very important. What is important is the concept because we are going to use it, use them somewhere. Let's look at uh, an example. I saw one about materiality and I wanted us to look at it. Materiality. I hope I tapotea. You can also give me a question where we have anything to do with materiality to one of the to Nashambua. Who has a question? I saw one about materiality, lakini me potea kidogo.
I was trying to look at but reality, but then uh, I got a question. I got a question about before before accepting and uh, when accepting the audit engagement. Let me share with you this question. You can look at it. Let me start discussing. It's just what we've covered now. Before and after the engagement. So, uh, Now, which group can I send to? We are in so many groups. I'll send to the lunch hour group. To okay. so your question, we just ban it today. Have you seen the question? Ah, yeah. Continuation, yeah, your question. I'm sending uh, there. I've sent the continuation. So, I don't know how you will change it from your side. Maybe you just twist it, rotate it so that uh, it makes sense. Then the other one is continuation of that case study. That is what we've just talked about here. Uh, matters to consider and procedures to be done before accepting an appointment. We talked about looking at the competency of the staffs. We talked about communicating with the outgoing auditor, quality control procedures, if you have them as an audit firm. We talked about the integrity of the client. Do you understand the engagement? What about the ethical standards? What about the time that you need and resources that you have? Those are the things that they are asking. Describe the matters to consider within your firm and other procedures that must be understood, undertaken before accepting engagement. Imagine it was that simple. So I was looking for something to do with the materiality, but Nimeona here, and I felt I need to give it to you and try. So let's discuss those ones. Let's continue discussing them in our WhatsApp groups so that we know that uh, we really understand what is being done. So let me just proceed because I need to finish this process. He tendering process he to Limaliza, upper to Limaliza to Lianzia. Somebody told me that we needed to go through this a brief, uh, a kidogo, briefly. Is it true? We didn't understand tendering process. Is there any person who has a problem here? We had discussed this. 
Tusha piti ya iye. There's no problem. Mama. To piti ya tena. So you are saying that uh, audit like any other job, uh, you need to do tendering. And the first thing is to pick the tender document. Uh, when job is advertised for audit, they normally tell you come and pick tender document from place like this, like this. So uh, those tender documents, uh, you will pick them and fill. So once you pick the tender document, you will prepare them. Yani, kama wanataka title deed, weke. Kama wanataka to license, weke. Kama wanataka approvals, proof that you you applied anything, maybe money, you need to go and deposit 1,000 in the account, then attach. Those are tender. Those are tenders that you're preparing. After that, you ask yourself, but am I qualified? Is there a part of qualification requirements that are left out, maybe in terms of the experience? Then you now put those ones again there. Then once you've checked qualification, that everything, tender document has been filled very well, and all qualification requirements have been attached. We may just attend a document. Now we can attach all the requirements. Then now you submit the tender. Where we come and audit from, you submit the tender. So these are the four main topics. Uh, stages. You pick the tender documents. After picking the tender document, prepare, fill, fill everything, attach all the qualification requirements that are required, then now submit the tender. Once you've submitted the tender, the officers from the other side, the client will evaluate your tender. That is evaluating. They will now award the contract to the right person. Once they are awarded, the last stage should be, which they didn't include here, the last stage should have been, they communicate with the person who has won the tender. And again, to congratulate or show the appointment, not notice. But again, Sisi, kama wenye pijapata yu kazi, here they will always send us information that uh, unfortunately, haujapata, lakini try to next time, we can look into it. So that is it. And appointment of auditors here to meangalia, is there any question on the tender? I was just passing through. Tender, tender, tender. The first stage was a tender document. You pick the tender document, prepare it by filling. So this one, an audit firm prepares a tender document, which must adhere to certain conditions that have been given by the client and contain certain components are requested by the client. Uh, each process might may have its own requirement, but generally tenderers should include a draft contract. So the tender document has a draft contract. This contract should include the general terms and conditions and address any special conditions. It should provide an explanation for proposed tender, terms and conditions, and include a model for financial bid for the audit project. Then you now look for the requirements. You now look at the description of the expert, of the personnel, the experts that are required, the audit team members that are required. Those are qualifications. If you have show the audit strategy also, uh, time time that you take, evidence of relevant experience, that is publication now, publication. Then now you submit the tender. That's the need to raise come here. You pick the tender, you fill the tender, attach all the qualification, then submit, they will evaluate, then award the tender, and then report on those ones. In Kupitia too, the notes you'll still get, but at least uh, you understand. Under this one, appointment we talked about, disqualification we have discussed, we also discussed all this. Maybe the only planning, planning we just looked at the importance of planning to Shangalia Ukoju. So that is quite repetition. To Mangalia planning, it helps the auditor to, be, uh, to put their appropriate time on the most important areas. So that is quite important. Those are importance of planning or roles of planning. Those ones we have looked at. Budgeting, I've never seen them talking about that, but uh, the aim of budget is basically to aid planning, to monitor the actual cost, the engagement, to estimate and negotiate edit fees when you, when you budget. This one you can write, though it is not very important. They never bring them in exam. I've never seen it anyway, but you can write it.
just right the aim of planning so and any budgeting the aim of budgeting i think we are almost uh, towards the end of this particular topic our next topic the common topic will be will be forensic audit that is a common topic i think after that is there really common again we've done reporting and those are the ones we are now in topic five reporting is eight the next common topic that we can also do is about emerging issues that is also a common topic reporting to Shafanya, so magic issues. This one I can copy for, for you, then I just put it uh, on message on uh, the chat box so that you can also copy and paste chat box, chat box. Let me put it for you there. You have it there. You can now copy it from your side and just uh, make the notes on WhatsApp or whatever. So again, the most important area here. Okay, when you are doing plan, when you are doing plan, you need to review the previous year's audit file. This is very important. Uh, the reason why you're doing this, when you are planning, you have audited account for last year. You also have the draft account for this year. You have to be given two accounts, audited account for last year and today's draft account. One of the things that you look at are the MA management letter for last year. The reason why you look at the management letter for last year, you want to look at the issues that were raised by the previous auditor, but has not been sorted. Thank you very much. Uh, you posted that. Thank you very much, James. This is good of you. Nice. So whoever wants to look at it can look at it. Eh? Though we are so many in this group, but majority didn't log in. I hope they will log in sometime. Ana watu waja log in sana, sana, sana. Okay, so we are saying that uh, you look at the last year's file. When you look at the last year's file, one of the things that you'll get uh, are the audit report for last year, and of course, management letter for last year. Audit report for last year and management letter for last year. So that one you'll be able to get from last year's file. So those things that you're looking at, the points that were brought last year, that is what we are talking about, management ML points. You remember when we are talking about management letter, we showed, I showed you practical example how it looks like. Those issues that were raised are called management points or management letter points, ML points. Now those points that were brought forward, you have to consider them this year, the points, those issues that you raised the previous year's audit, you have to bring them and check them this year. The next one, you need to check if any areas where time or cost savings could be made, for example, already you have title lead, title logbook copies. You can easily save time instead of again looking for them, asking for logbook, title lead, at your nine you know. copy. No. You just tell them to show you the original, you compare with what you have already in the file, you save time. Audit procedures that were used last year. If you are the same client, then that file can help you know the areas that are of high risk that were identified. You can easily save time by focusing on those areas because already you have the audit procedure that were indicated in the file. Your file, Iliquina Sema, these are the areas that you're going to focus and that this is how you're going to perform the audit procedure. So instead of making a new file, working on it, we have that file that can help you always guide you. It can guide you how you do the audit. If there is any previously unidentified areas of risk, audit risk, you can now focus on those areas now. If it was not identified as areas of audit risk, you can now focus on those areas now. Now that is previous years audit file. Now we have what is called audit plan and audit program. Audit plan is the old thing, the old thing. So audit plan, includes the nature, timing, and extent of the audit procedures to be performed. That is audit plan. The nature of audit, the timing of audit, and the extent of the audit. Then we have what is called program. 
these now the procedures that you're going to perform. For example, if I'm going to do audit for PPEs, what is the audit program? Utangalia hivi na hivi, ask for this, ask for this, ask for this. That is audit program. You verify the logbook. Do a search, come on atapanya search. Physical observation, request for fixed asset register. That is PPEs. So that is audit program. So audit program, audit plan is quite wider than audit program. Sasa. So let's look at, you come on, I define audit program somewhere. Audit program. So uh, the audit program documents the nature, timing, and extent of this procedure to perform. What is important here is the audit procedure we performed at the assertion level for each material class of transaction. Like I've given example of PPEs. For each material class of transactions or account balances, the program sets out the nature, timing, and extent. So you can know that I'm going to check this one at what time. Come on, PPEs, this is how I'm going to look at it. Sasa. So the audit program will often be drafted by the senior and reviewed by the manager, meaning that where you tasema, these are the procedures that I'm going to follow. So audit program and these procedures are quite the same. But you have to say, when I'm looking at the PPE, hapa na hapa na hapa. Then again, in the afternoon, I look at loans. When I'm looking at the loans, number one, I need to understand the nature of that audit. Is it something that maybe there are loans for insiders, loan lending, or general customers? Or are they loans that have security or not? So that one is the nature of the audit. So, so specific item, remember, we are talking about for those things that you're looking at, timing, extent, procedures for, 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 for each material class of transaction. So if the material class of transaction were under loans, then now you look at that. Like in the planning, the overall planning, you look at the resources that we have with the allocation of people. Those ones are not under program. Program is now going deeper, specifically on the audit procedure. I hope you are seeing the differences. Program is for the specific item that you are auditing. Then now, planning activities, these are actually things that we actually looked at. So identify the characteristics of the engagement that defines the scope. So planning activities are just things that we discussed. So under the planning activities, the things that you do during planning, things that you do during planning. The auditor shall establish the overall audit strategy that sets the scope, timing, direction of the audit that guides the development of the audit plan. So uh, during planning activities, things that we do is to identify the careers of the engagement, ascertain the reporting objectives, consider the factors that uh, in the auditor's opinion or professional judgments are significant, are significant in directing the engagement team's effort. Consider the results of preliminary engagement. Ascertain the nature, timing, and extent of resources that you need to perform the engagement. So this planning, resources, timing, you know, things that you can consider to be expensive and then are significant. So this is quite general. Uh, but uh, rarely do they bring them, like strategy, they never bring this, but you can find time to go through them during your normal revision time. Key component of the strategy. So those are not very. What is important here again is uh, communication with the client or those who are charged with governance. Communication with those who are charged with governance. So we are basically saying that uh, one of the things that you can never forget to do is to communicate with those who are charged with governance, the management, keep on discussing with them issues. So discussion with those clients, with the client will be an essential aid to develop the audit strategy. The discussion will usually take place before the accounting year end. It would be preferred to have a pre-audit meeting with the client to make sense on some key areas. That can be through telephone where necessary. So one of the primary aim of such discussion is to be able uh, to enable the auditor to update his knowledge of the client's business. The auditor just want to have discussion so that he can understand the client's nature of business well 
an auditor should have sufficient knowledge of the business to enable him to carry out the audit. That actually requires a conversation or discussion before the date of audit. So some of the discussion that you make with a client will aim at obtaining the latest financial information to help in setting materiality level. Agree on the timetable with the client. When do the client want the report to be delivered? You can agree on that. Agree on schedule requirements and any other accounting work to be produced by the client. If there's anything, you can always write a list of requirements. So when you talk about the schedule requirements, schedule requirements, these are lists that the auditor sends to the client. Let me show you an example of schedule requirements. Schedule requirements. List of requirement for some audit. Ah, yeah. So our list of requirement become a higher system. Become a higher. So you can send a list of the requirement to uh, like now here. The trial balance and draft account for the period the year. You need that. That is a list of requirement. All ledgers for 2019 we need. We need copies of Sasara report and correspondence, including Sasara license for the head office and the branches. So you want the Sasara license to show that uh, these guys are actually operating uh, legally. You need a list of the bank accounts and reconciliation statements. These are the list of requirements you will send to the client prior to audit. Aujafika. List of all bank accounts and reconciliation statements. List of top 10 borrowers, top 10 clients that uh, they have given money, and top 10 savers. Board of directors meetings for the last AGM and uh, the year during the year and the last AGM. If there is any management letter for 2019, 20, 2018. So this one was audited for 2018, 2019, remember? We were going to audit for 2019, but we are telling the client to give us management letter for 2018. Why? Because there were some issues that were raised last year, which is 2018. We want to check now if they have been, they have been sorted this year. And that is where we were looking at the prior year's file. The prior year's file has some of these issues, management letter for last year. Tunata Kwangalia, the response. Yeah, with the management response. Natuliona will the management response in a case, the column where they're supposed to respond. Internal audit report for the period that ends 2019. Report issued by any other consultant. If there is any other consultant like IT, HR, we want to see their report. What are they saying? So these are a list of requirements. These are a list of requirements that you have to send to the client before you engage yourself. Now, Note that items above um, require, are required within one week before we visit the site. This will assist us in planning. You require them during planning for the audit. In addition, you also request the following. Under loan management, we need the loan register, member listing, or member register, all loans and advance that has been taken during the year, directors and staff loans, those are insider loanings. Then when you come to policies and procedures of giving loans, the schedule of members who have outstanding loans. Then under income, you need files on schedule members contribution receiving during the year, huh? received during the year, files detailing all other incomes that can come to the company. You need to have a list of all sources of income. Then members contribution. If there is any outstanding income, you also need that list. So that is an example of list of requirements list of requirements. I know you guys are now tired and it's almost time. So those are things that you might require. I'll share with you these notes, don't worry. Change to planning. Uh -huh. This one was changes to planning, decision during course of the audit.
So if you had made a plan for audit, audit plan, then what can make you change the audit plan? If you realize that the risk level has changed, that one can make you change the audit plan. Risk level. I'm looking at the areas where mostly they can bring questions uh, so that we can give priority on those ones. So uh, during audit risk assessment, we talked about this audit risk assessment. When you are doing the risk assessment, what are some of the sources of information or evidence that you might require? Inquiries from management, prior year information, current year management reports, and analytical procedures, observation. So these are sources of evidence that you can use during risk assessment. Sources of evidence during risk assessment. Sources of evidence during risk assessment. These are the ones. Let me show you these ones or some of the sources of evidence. But I want to be here to make your work easier and easily and easily get them. Those are how you can gather evidence during risk assessment. You can inquire from management. You can check the previous year's financial statement, like the way I've explained, both financials and MLML, current year management accounts and budgets, analytical procedures, observation and inspection. So, so. Okay, key definition. These ones I know you discussed. Business risk, we know. Assertion. Is there anybody who doesn't understand assertion, what it means? So these are key terms, internal control, risk assessment, procedures, significant risk, those ones we understand. Uh, how do we understand risk? Those ones have given you the same things, prior period knowledge, and record procedures. Uh -huh. Are beliefs or claims? Yeah, those are beliefs or claims. Those are beliefs or claims. Yeah, is there anything here now? I think the topic is done. Top down approach, which ones are this? Those are not even examinable. Methodology risk based audit or oh. risk based audit. So, audit methodologies, these are the approaches that you can use when you're doing audit. So, one of them is called risk based audit. So risk-based audit, meaning that you are auditing while focus on the most risk areas. It refers to development of, of audit techniques that are responsive to risk factors of an audit. So when you're performing audit, you focus on risk areas or risk, risk factors. That is what we call risk-based audit. So what can actually, what has uh, resulted to risk-based audit? Why do people now do what is called risk-based audit? Because of the complexity of the business environment. That is why we now do risk-based audit. There are a lot of routes. So you need to focus on areas of high risk so that at least you can be able to identify them. So this one can be caused, of, uh, can be caused by computerized system, internationalization of business, like the business has gone global, so it becomes complex. So the high risk and the time is short. Then pressure, pressure, pressure on clients to exert, exerted by audit clients on the auditors to keep fee levels down. So you cannot be able to do audit exhaustively. You need to select areas because the audit fee is very low. You don't have time, but the client wants the best. So because of that pressure that is being exerted on the audit clients to the auditors to keep audit fees level, uh, uh, keep fee levels down, you can actually focus on I, on risk-based audit. So what do you do? Save your time by doing what is called risk-based audit. Another reason why we do risk-based audit is to reduce the risk, audit risk, so that at least the chances of you giving a wrong report is low because you focus on most dangerous areas, most risky areas. So those are that is what means mostly they can ask you about 
those are the areas that they can ask you. I've never seen them asking about this one top-down approach. So with a top-down approach, also known as the business risk approach, not audit, audit risk, or not risk-based, but business risk. So control testing is aimed at high-level controls and substantive testing. This is the normal procedures where I just do the normal uh, control test, substantive test, ukienda kutaputa, where the problems could be, but you're not focusing on basically on risk areas. They never said it, but maybe they can at one point, so you need to go through them again. Advantages of risk-based audit, advantages of business risk, those ones would appear here when you have time. They never said that, but just, you can just go through them. Materiality, you should sharp it here, materiality. So, materiality, bad or materiality, it doesn't activities, but not examining. I think we can stop there. Most of these things are now repetition, like now, how do you collect evidence, procedures of collecting evidence, inquiry, and analytical, the same. So I think we can stop from there. Unless there is any question, internal control and environment, those ones have explained, internal control environments, those ones have explained. Any question before to close? Notes I'll share. Kindly share the notes. Yes, that one I will. I will. So, uh, so let's stop there. Uh, the rest are just quite repetition and risk assessment. They are just notes for further illustration, but I've done them. Okay, maybe I can talk about you know, engagement risk. These ones I've looked at. Inherent risk, control risk. Engagement risk is the same as audit risk. Audit risk, I've been talking about it several times and I've discussed it. This is the risk that the practitioner can express an inappropriate conclusion when the subject matter, matter information is materially stated. Then you are saying that the financial statements are okay when they are wrong. So those ones we have looked at and the types of risk are inherent risk, control risk, and detective risk. These are Tuliangalia, I think, lunch hour. Tuliangalia at a lunch hour. So those are the areas that we know. Uh, the rest are just repetition. And match. So let's close from there. That is basically control environment. These are Tuliangalia. Communication and enforcement of integrity. These so are Tuliangalia. Commitment, participation, but those are child governance, philosophy and operating style. These are Tuliangalia over Jews. We have looked at those ones, but you'll find time to go through them again. Otherwise, uh, I request that we stop there. So have a good night. These are just an explanation of what we have looked at, detection risk, inherent risk, talking about nothing much, nothing new, nothing. I'll stop there. Then now we'll proceed from our next class. Any question? Time here in Africa. I like the way you guys are sharing, sharing, sharing. Thank you very much. What will be the next topic? Our next whole topic should be uh, our next topic should be forensic audit, forensic accounting, or forensic audit. So, 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 uh. Those who have not paid, kindly engage uh, George Malize. Kama ulikuwa uko and you moved with us, also clear with him, just give him proof of payment, sawa, so that we have one common group. We need to have only one group, that is triple A paid group. Sawa, sawa. So kama ujalipa kitu, please do. Kindly, tomorrow at lunch hour, let us tackle one case study. Lunch hour, lunch hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do one class, lunch hour. We can do one class. How many will be available? How many will be available for lunch hour class?
Ya tomorrow ni saa 2. Mtakuwa? Tomorrow ni saa 2. Mtakuwa? Purity. Will you be there? Ruth will be in charge. So it means that we have to share with you the recordings. Okay, so, so uh, we'll meet that time. Alafo, our next class will be on forensic audit. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Bring more clans, give referrals, and let your neighbors join class so that uh, we can also have improve. We can also improve on our cameras and use the board instead of just sharing. Eh? So, so when you promote Malim, you'll be able now to use the board. Others, thank you very much. Have a good night. We promote Malimo, then we share. We organize the studio very well.